welcome everybody again to the 28th meeting now of this group. Um, today we are going to be looking at uh, some of the work by uh, the UK Transfusion Laboratory Collaborative. For those of you working in transfusion, you, you, you'll probably come across the work of Kerry and Jenny in the past. They're two well-established and, and respected individuals within our within our field. Uh, we've got Kerry Dowling, who is the Blood Transfusion and Phlebotomy Manager in Southampton, and Jenny Davis, who is the Blood Transfusion Manager at the Northern Devon Healthcare Trust. Um, and I think on that, um, I will welcome our speakers to uh, to get started and to introduce the group and the work of the group and um, talk about some of the, the recent work they've done on the 2023 survey. So over to you, Kerry and Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Danny. Um, so we're going to, as Danny says, we're going to have a recap of the UK TLC and the work that is going on. And our main fo focus today is going to be talking about the newly released 2023 standards. So what is the UK TLC? Well, its definition is a collaboration of UK transfusion laboratory professionals who use evidence based tools to reduce errors occurring within transfusion labs and improve patient safety in the field of blood transfusion. So what does that mean in practice? Um, and we're going to look into that further today. These are our collaborators. So it's not uh, laboratory professionals on their own. We stand together with, with the list of organisations here um, and you should recognise most of these. I'm not going to go through the list, but it's there for your information. So how did this start? Why does it exist? And what are we hoping to achieve? The UK TLC was originally formed in back in 2006, and it was formed in response to recognition that 30 to 40 percent of the wrong blood events reported to SHOT were originating from inside hospital transfusion laboratories. So at the, at the time, the SHOT team approached the IBMS to facilitate meetings with key stakeholders working in the laboratory arena to consider what the causes are of the errors and how we might find solutions and how we might reduce the error rate. So at this point, the UK TLC and its collaborators were launched. If we look today at the latest um, report that's just been released, the 2021 SHOT report, transfusion is, is still a relatively safe practice with a related risk of death at 0.92 per 100,000 components. However, still today, 81.3% of the reports received by SHOT are still due to preventable errors. And from the last report, 18.1 of those preventable errors occurred in the laboratory. It is a small decrease from 2020, so hopefully we, we are improving, but um, still a large error rate to address there. And when you look at the, those errors, you can group them into various themes. So the themes that are really coming out are training and competency, loan working, um, errors related to the use of limbs and other IT and communication problems. So back in 2009, the UK TLC, based upon the evidence that they gathered from, from surveys and the workshops, put together a set of recommendations. And the aim of those recommendations was to assist organisations to reduce the errors that were occurring in BT labs by providing a framework for education, training and the use of information technology. But what actually happened following the release of the 2009 recommendations? Well, there was a prediction that we'd see a 50% reduction in the errors um, that are reported to SHOT, but unfortunately this wasn't achieved. And in fact, there was an increase in the IT error scene. So further surveys were, were carried out to pick up on what was going here on here and how laboratories were maybe having issues with implementing the recommendations. And one of the common responses from, from the laboratories was that although the recommendations themselves were excellent, they didn't carry any weight and management saw them as recommendations only and no mandatory action was required. So they went back to the drawing board and the last set of standards prior to the ones that have just been released were the 2014 redrafted set. And rather than recommendations, they were now badged as standards with the support of MHRA and later on UCAS, um, where they might incorporate these into their in inspection, giving the standards some teeth. So what happened next? 
Well, the 2022 survey results haven't been released yet, but the 2019 survey results showed us that staffing levels remained a concern. There was a pressure to meet high workload um, and staff were working extra hours to meet the demand. There's a high level of inexperienced staff who require a lot of training um, and specialist support when they come into the role and an increased level of vacancies. And when the 2022 survey results are released, we'll find there's not much of a difference. So there are still um, concerns around number of vacancies and the calibre of HCPC registered scientists coming into the profession and the amount of training and education they require. Um, and there's still a high use of, of locums to support the vacancy factor. There are some positive things coming. So uh, there's a signal about learning from excellence, that laboratories are embracing learning from excellence. We're seeing an increase in laboratories having capacity plans. Um, so some positive signals. Also in 2019, the UKTLC put out a culture survey. So this was the first time that they did this. And that was because they were receiving anecdotal reports um, that were worrying about disciplinary action taken against individuals as a result of uh, shot or sabre reportable incidents, um, full root cause analysis not being conducted, data being changed or manipulated, and staff being criticised for actions they'd taken or suggested, um, and some distress within the profession about this. And that survey showed that there were respondents out there who were aware of colleagues being disciplined as a result of sabre or shot reportable events. There were respondents who had felt under pressure from their managers or those senior in the hospital to present an unrealistic picture, either in their compliance reports or in their responses to shot and sabre. Um, and that the there was an increase in the amount of staff who were reluctant to work in transfusion, citing the additional pressures over and above that of working, for example, in a haematology laboratory. If we look at the ongoing error rates, this is data taken from shot reports from 2015 to the latest one. Um, we can see that we're starting to see a slight reduction, but we're still sitting around that 18%. So where are we now? What's happening now? Well, the world has changed since 2014 when the last set of standards were released. So the UK TLC went back to the drawing board. The work started a couple of years ago to look at and revise those 2014 standards. And that was centred around several things that we know. So the data that we were seeing from the UK TLC surveys, including the culture data, which was a new, a new finding for us. Changes in clinical and laboratory practice. So we work in an ever-changing field. So things obviously have changed since 2014. Um, advances that we've seen in IT and automation. Bringing in the future. So Transfusion 2024 programme. And there are changes in the education that's available since 2014. So what was the ethos behind redrafting the 2014 standards and what are we hoping to achieve with those? So as I said, we want to conform with changes in transfusion laboratory medicine and think about what the future changes to try and future proof the standards a bit. And that includes the need for full vein to vein information technology. The aim is for the standards to be as pragmatic as possible while still improving transfusion laboratory safety. So a set of standards that you are able to implement in your own areas. And the UK TLC as a whole are looking to be an approachable um, set of collaborators who can offer some sort of support. And therefore, with the standards, we have provided examples and support documentation. So there's a gap analysis and there are some examples of capacity plans, uh, which Jen is going to talk you through later. Um, and some examples of how to do various things that are listed in the standards. So the new 2023 standards are split into four main categories. The first one being staffing, and that talks about staffing levels, capacity plan and, and including the QMS and appropriate specialist staffing availability. The second section is around qualifications, knowledge and skills. 
So that covers not only our HCPC registered scientists um, from band seven and above to band fives, but also those in training, any support staff and any staff who support the transfusion service, for example, uh, quality managers. We have our information technology section that looks at automation, limbs and electronic transfusion systems and the new section around a just culture that staff should be encouraged to report errors and near miss events and that we should have a learning culture, learning from excellence um, and with staff feeling safe to review, report and prevent these events from happening. So we start with the first section on staffing. So why staffing? We have lots of evidence of unsafe practice related to in inadequate staffing levels. And that evidence comes from shot reports and Sabre reports and UK TLC surveys and workshops. We know that there are lots of challenges out there with recruitment and retention of the scientific workforce. We know that we often have a high turnover and we have a set of very inexperienced staff. So those that are leaving at one end are being replaced with inexperienced staff who perhaps do not have their basic serology knowledge to underpin what they're doing in transfusion. And all of this has an impact on staff morale and we end up in that vicious cycle where people continue to leave the profession. How can we address this? So these are some of the things that are included within the standards. So there's a lot of emphasis on a good capacity plan and that capacity plan should cover all your service elements, including quality management system and education functions. As I said, Jenny's going to talk to us a bit more about that. It's about having an adequate number of staff to provide a safe service and how you might achieve that and adequate specialist staff for supervision and advice for those junior people who are coming into the profession. So we can encourage them to stay within the profession and become senior staff themselves one day. It talks about incorporating risk assessment and reviewing through governance structures. So it's all well and good having your capacity plan, but what do you do when you can't meet it? And how do we highlight those risks to prompt staffing reviews and get investment or have a mitigation strategy? So I'm going to hand over to Jenny to talk about capacity planning. Super, thanks Kerry. Right, so we're just going to spend a bit, a bit of time talking about capacity planning and how to do it. Um, capacity planning is a really important piece of work that provides evidence supporting the staff levels that you need to provide a safe transfusion service, as Kerry said. And the evidence is based on facts, so it can be used to support business cases if you find that your current staffing levels are inadequate. And this all sounds really obvious and easy, but actually it's incredibly hard to do a capacity plan. There's no magic formula that you can use, and it's really individual to each lab based on your workload, your levels of automation and your local processes and ways of working. And this slide shows the basics of how to create your capacity plan. So identifying your work areas, your tasks and skill levels, calculating the time needed to complete the tasks, doing your mapping exercises, identifying any gaps, escalating risks and agreeing improvement actions. And this should be mapped to the good practice guide wherever possible. And to help with this, the UK TLC and SHOT have created a capacity planning guidance and methodology for Transfusion Laboratories document, and this is on the UK TLC page of the SHOT website. And we'll have a look in detail about how to do each of these things. So thank you. Uh, so probably the first thing you want to do is process map your different tasks. And this breaks them down and allows you to look in detail at each separate aspect of the task. And here we're looking at a sample processing task. And you can see in each of the tiles at the top, the blue ones, the component steps of the process. It's a really simplistic view, obviously. And in the orange tiles, then there are examples of the sorts of questions that you might ask to ascertain how the task is completed, whether you've got automation used or not, where are things coming from, going to, etc. And then in the green tiles, you can record the grade of staff that does the task. And you can use other tools such as spaghetti diagrams. And these can be really useful to establish the optimum layout of the lab, as once you've done your spaghetti diagram, you can see where everyone is having to walk to and from to complete tasks. 
And this then gives you a really detailed picture of the way that you deliver your service. So next slide, please. So when you make your calculations about the number of staff that you need, don't forget to add in the time that's lost. And this time includes sickness, annual leave, maternity leave, time for mandatory training and course attendance. And in the guidance document that we have on the website, we've provided these estimates that you can use for that part of your calculation. And you probably already have a set number of staff that can be allowed leave per day, and that's so that you never knowingly leave yourselves too short of staff. But at the bottom, then we've given you some ideas of how to calculate that figure as well. So although the workload of each individual task and staff groups need to be reviewed, there are some general principles as well that you need to think about when starting off on your capacity plan. So the workload varies obviously during a 24 hour period and also we have tasks that we only do weekly, monthly or maybe annually. And then think about whether you're aware of any future changes to the workload that could be an increase or a decrease in the workload. And you will need some agreed key performance indicators that can be monitored and used as markers for deficiencies in ca capacity. And these are often things like turnaround times outside your set limits or cappers open post the target dates, overdue audits, SOPs, training, competency assessments, things like that that you can measure. And if you don't have capacity to provide the service, then these are normally the first things to show up as deficient because you're obviously having to put all hands on deck to provide the essential work for patients. And look at your quality management system and make sure things like the audit calendar are realistic and are included in your workload and they're not just something that you do in a rush before an inspection. And also you need to think about what you're going to do if you don't have enough staff to provide the service. What's your contingency plan and document what level of service you can provide when the staffing levels reach critical points. And obviously make sure that your senior management are clear about this and they've seen the plans and have oversight of it. So once you've identified all the tasks that you do in the lab and remembering that this is not just the tests, it's also things like analyzer maintenance and quality control, cleaning, answering the phone, reagent management, responding to equipment alerts, all your quality management activities, sending samples away, etc. You really need to add all of these things into the list. And when you have this list, you can then set about calculating the time it takes to complete each task. And you can do this by creating self audit sheets like this one shown on the slide where people fill them in themselves and they add the times that they take to complete each part of, of a task, each component part. And then you can use this to estimate the total hands on time required. Uh, experienced staff may be quicker than inexperienced staff and so it's always best to get this completed by a selection of staff so you get an average time that it takes. Or alternatively you could get somebody to come into the lab and do a time and motion study for your activity follow and the person then records the times that it takes for the staff to complete the task. And this actually can be a really good way on pick, of, to pick up all the little things that we do in the lab that may get missed in a self audit. But you do need to obviously make sure that that doesn't affect the staff doing the work at the time. And there's also some electronic apps and tools that can help you record the time and analyze the results as well. And for tasks that are not performed every day, then you can estimate the time required by looking at how often the task is performed and how long it takes. So once you have all of the task timings, you can then join this together with your workload figures to estimate the number of staff required to get the jobs done. And this example here on this slide shows an estimate for the number of staff required at band two or three level. And in the first column, we've put a list of all the tasks that they do. In the second column, there's the number of times that the task is done. For example, the number of tasks, that, the number of samples that need booking in during a 12 hour shift and the time taken to do each sample. And then this can be multiplied up to estimate the amount of time that it takes in total, which is in the third column. 
And then at the bottom of the table, you can see the total time for all the tasks and then the number of full time equivalent staff that you need on a daily basis. And you can do this for each of the staff groups. Next slide, please. And then working on from that, you can then generate an agreed staffing levels document like this example shown here. And this shows you how many staff you should have on each day. And then on the right hand side, you can record how many staff you actually had on a given day. And this can be rag rated like it is in this example. And this gives a really clear and easy process to escalate up to senior management for review. And this sort of compliance chart can be used in conjunction with your key performance indicators to give this clear evidence based picture of your capacity and staffing levels. And from this, you can then start the discussion and agree action plans to resolve any deficiencies that you have in capacity. So escalation will be different in different organisations, but it does need to be formal through quality or risk meetings, management, management meetings or governance. And this slide shows an example of how you might display an identified risk from your monitoring. And this reporting might be monthly or quarterly, depending on, on your local requirements. But on this example, a risk of being able to provide training and competency has been identified. And you can see here that the it's been agreed in the capacity plan that 0.3 full time equivalents required. But in this quarter, there's only been 0.1 full time equivalent available to do this. And the impact of this is clearly shown in the last column, which has been an increase in reportable events. And this is linked to GPG. And a mitigation or action has been identified that long term absence needs addressing and the group that this goes to will be asked to provide support to address this. So perhaps funding for locums or fixed term contracts or something like that. But it's not always about getting more staff. Um, if you identify your deficiencies in capacity, there may be other ways to improve by working smarter. So looking at your technology and equipment, is it adequate and effective? Can the limbs and electronic blood management systems be implemented or upgraded to provide things that free up staff time, such as electronic issue or remote issue using the electronic delivery note from the blood service? Or could you automate more tests or could you have a telephone triage system to reduce the number of calls coming through to the lab? And you can look at whether tasks can be moved from one staff group to another or in, maybe into a wider pool of people across blood sciences, for example. Can you employ on fixed term contracts if you're doing a time limited project? And also have a look at your environment. If you did a spaghetti diagram, does it show you that the staff are having to move about too much to get jobs done? Could you move equipment to reduce that? and have a look at lean principles as well and see whether you can remove any non value adding tasks. And there's some other considerations on this slide. Sorry, it's a bit wordy this slide, but you maybe want to look at whether your equipment is fit for purpose or are you spending too much time fixing it or doing workarounds and maybe it's time to get some replacement equipment. Look at your rotors. Have you got them right in terms of the skill mix and the level of experience? Have you got any planned projects coming up and do you need to restrict staff leave for this? And similarly for, for meetings that you've planned, have you restricted staff leave so you don't have to cancel those at the last minute? And lastly, when planning changes, include the staffing requirement needed for the change in your change control, but also any impacts that that change might have on staffing levels afterwards. Uh, your capacity plan, as I said at the beginning, it, it does provide that evidence for you that supports business cases for more staff and better equipment and changes in working practice. And although it's a bit of a challenge to do, the time taken to create it is worth it in the end. So we're going to move on to the next section of the new standards, which is qualifications, knowledge and skills. So we know that inadequate knowledge can lead to errors and a negative impact on our patients. Um, and we know that 23.2% of the 2020 shot reports um, involved members of staff lone working. So the standards are looking at guidance for qualifications required and how we competency assess people. 
and the standards are set to cover all staff, including locums and staff that may be supporting the transfusion service. And it's split into um, the level of expertise. So your advanced scientists or those working at band seven and above, uh, we would expect to hold one of these qualifications to support the role that they are doing. Um, we talked about being pragmatic in our approach, and perhaps it's not always possible to have one of these specific qualifications, or perhaps you've had, got someone who's been in the role for a long time and has a significant amount of experience. So there is a second option to risk assess the post and the person's um, experience against the qualification. And you can do this by benchmarking against the IBMS higher specialist learning outcomes. Um, and as part of trying to support laboratories to implement these, we've put some examples on the UKTLC website of how you might do this. Looking further into supporting our advanced scientists to provide their role within the laboratory, it's important that they are able to keep up their practical skills as well. So the standards ask that they complete 10 working days per year on the laboratory bench doing practical tasks. That they participate in practical and knowledge based competencies and that those competencies and education that they do include leadership and quality management. So they will be our leaders for the future and our advanced scientists are future transfusion laboratory managers. The standards talk about having specialist advice available at all times for our junior staff, and there are several ways that you might be able to provide that. It may be that you're working in a network and therefore you have, um, you're able to contact senior staff out of hours, or there are on-call systems or other types of rosters that can be put into place. The other thing that the standards talk about are not routinely rostering band seven and above staff for practical service provision and for out of hours provision. Then we move on to our band six scientific staff and again a list of qualifications to support what the tasks that they're performing in the laboratory but with the same pragmatic approach that you may have someone with a significant amount of experience and this time you can match against the IBMS specialist portfolio learning outcomes and there are, there are, again, is an example on the UK TLC website. And we would expect our band five staff to be working towards these qualifications for their progression in the future. And again, the expectation of the standards is that this includes all scientific staff working at these bands in transfusion. So we're including locum staff and that locum staff should also be included in your competency assessment programme within your laboratory. And there's also a focus on multidisciplinary staff. So if you have multi multidisciplinary BMSs that are working perhaps across uh, chemistry and haematology blood transfusion, those staff members should again be at least doing 10 days on the bench in blood transfusion specifically per year, working practically, providing the routine service. Going on to think about trainees and support staff, um, the standards are clear that anyone who's undergoing training should always be supervised by a HCPC registered staff member. They should not be working alone. And when we think about support staff, so your associate practitioners, your band fours, your, your medical laboratory assistants, they should have a locally defined scope of practice and always have access to HCPC registered staff members. We would expect quality managers supporting the transfusion service to have a qualification from Appendix A, or if they don't, to seek advice from someone who does um, when they are making decisions about quality management in the blood transfusion laboratory. And for quality managers to participate in CPD about the regulatory aspects of transfusion services, so to understand our regulators, uh, the MHRA. Talking a bit about uh, training induction and competency, so there's an expectation for all staff to have an induction into the transfusion laboratory, to have a training programme that covers both technical and non-technical skills relevant to their role, and to have a periodic locally defined risk assessed programme of both practical and knowledge competency assessment that's regularly reviewed to make sure it meets the requirements of your service. 
And as we said before, all staff should be participating in that programme of competency assessment and training, whether they be their comes permanent staff fixed term. And all of this needs to link back to your capacity plan. So as Jen was describing, the training and competency element and education element takes time. And therefore, in your staff planning, you need to enable the time for this to happen. Using that and using your capacity plan, you can think about for your own service what your ratio of trained to trainee staff should be. So we're all going to have trainee staff um, and we want to develop our scientists for the future. But from your capacity plan, you can escalate when you're falling into a, a poor ratio of trained to trainee staff. And the standards go on to talk about having a training budget and protected time to facilitate education for our transfusion scientists. So the third section is information technology. Why is that important? Well, again, from the shot reports, we see ongoing errors in IT um, that have an impact on our patients. So in the 2020 report, there were 474 IT related errors. SHOT have a group called the UK Collaborative Reviewing and Reforming IT Processes in Transfusion, or SCRIPT for short, and they've already identified some key areas. We see deficiencies in upgrades of systems, for example, LIMS. We see missed opportunities for IT safety improvements. And despite the recommendation that electronic blood management systems should be implemented, they're no longer a nice to have, they are a requirement for transfusion. 43% of hospitals still did not have an EBMS, a full EBMS implemented. So the UK TLC standards talk about um, expectations in several of those areas. So the standards expect that all laboratories will have complete walkaway automation, which is in use 24 hours, seven days a week. So we're not looking at during the day you use your automation and at night you switch to something different. Um, the LIM system should comply with the MHRA requirements for electronic issue. And you, it goes on to talk about other elements that you need to consider for your LIMS. So contingency planning for when the LIMS is down. Inevitably, at some point, we're all going to face LIMS downtime and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, the standards talk about the merging of records and they link to the BSH IT guidelines. And obviously a key thing about the limbs ability to prevent ABO incompatible transfusions. Standards cover a couple of other things. So we talked about electronic blood management systems and how they should be considered in all clinical settings where transfusion takes place. They touch on remote temperature monitoring um, and the importance of having a robust escalation for when temperatures uh, deviate from what's expected. And the standards also touch on interfacing between these various systems. So the final section is around the just culture, and this is what the standards say. So laboratory management should support a just and learning culture where staff are encouraged to report errors, suggestions for improvements and risks that they might see that could affect patient safety. So there's a proactive approach as well here. We should be encouraging our teams to speak up when they see something that they're concerned about before an incident actually happens. There should be good processes for reporting and learning from excellence. So as human beings, we tend to focus on the negative, but there's a lot of excellent practice out there um, that we can all learn from. And I'd encourage you to support to report to the short learning from excellence um, category as well. When you're carrying out your incident investigation processes, they must include consideration of human factors and systems thinking and avoid just blaming individuals. So usually when something happens, uh, there are multiple root causes. And if you listen to any of Chris Robbie's talks, he will talk about how we very rarely get to what the actual root cause is that tend to stop at a human did something wrong. But actually, there's usually an underlying reason for that, whether it be the staffing level was low, they didn't have the support, there was a problem in the process or the technology. So we mentioned at the beginning that the standards um, have teeth and have done since 2014. So reaching out to our colleagues in the MHRA and UCAS, we thought it would be interesting for laboratory teams to understand how MHRA or UCAS might use these standards during an inspection. 
So the MHRA themselves inspect directly against the Good Practice Guide of 2018, but if they find a deficiency that's rooted in not following best practice principles, they will ask the trust to justify why those standards weren't followed. So in this case, something around staffing or capacity planning, they may go to the UK TLC standards and ask the trust to justify why they were not followed. And UCAS expect the labs to have reviewed all national guidance and justify if they're not acted upon. So for example, they'll bring in BSH guidance, the compatibility guidelines, and the UK TLC standards. And they may raise findings related to deficiencies in those standards. So where are we today? What are we focusing on? As we said, we want to be pragmatic, approachable, and helpful to our laboratory colleagues all working together to make transfusion laboratory a safer place and to improve the experience and safety of transfusion for our patients. We're trying to increase our profile with events like this. We have the website where there are resources available for you to use. We have a Twitter account and we will be having some further education events this year. The link is, is here, um, but we're hosted on the shop website. So really with the last sort of 10 minutes, we'd like to open up for discussions and questions about what we can do to help you in the future. Thank you. And shall I just say, Kerry, also we have a slot at the SHOT Symposium as well. So I'll put in the chat a link to the details about the SHOT Symposium. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Kerry and Jenny. So there's a, a comment in the chat uh, from Wayne. Having worked in transfusion science for almost 30 years, I still find a chronic lack of understanding of the principles of GLP and GMP, understanding the meaning of critical functions and knowing that if it's not written down, it wasn't done. No question, but perhaps uh, a comment there from, from Wayne. Yeah, it's really important, isn't it, to document everything. Um, in transfusion, for sure. I totally agree. And we've got a hand up from Giselle. Hi, thank you. Sorry, I was trying to unmute my mic there. So I'm sort of joining this webinar from a transfusion centre background rather than a hospital transfusion laboratory. Um, and I just wanted to ask sort of a question based on what we took out from the 2014 guidelines and also it was touched upon in your presentation earlier and it's around um the 10 days mandatory sort of on the bench training that's required um am i correct in taking from that that would be for multidisciplinary dominantly hospital-based staff who are perhaps qualified in biochemistry or immunology or another blood science um, and they're not transfusion specialists working in a routine transfusion body so they would have to carry out the 10 days mandatory bench training. Yeah, so there's two elements there. There's the one that you've just described. So your multidisciplinary staff who might work across multiple areas and that's to ensure that they have um, at least a minimum level of time working practically on the bench in transfusion and are able to catch up with any changes that may have happened um, and can work practically. The second group of staff where that's mentioned as a requirement are your advanced scientific staff, so your band sevens, um, and that's largely because they get pulled into quality management activities, which is appropriate, that's their role, um, but they still need to maintain the ability to work practically on the bench to be able to support and train the new staff coming through. Thank you. That, that's what I had thought. And where I suppose the uncertainty slightly arose was um, we operate an out of our service, which is a lone worker on call still. Um, and they're doing about um, a one in 10, one in 12 shift rota over the year. So they are so they may be band seven staff um, few band seven staff. But because they are participating regularly in out of hours on call, you know, that'll be issue, cross matching, investigation, whatever that function is. Are they covered by participating in their on call shifts and wouldn't have to do an additional 10 days? 
it's routine work. So for me personally, I would see that as working in the routine service during the day um, rather than out of hours alone um, where your services will be slightly different to what it is during the day. Um, and out of hours working alone, you don't have the support if they do come across something and they need they identify that they need to do some learning that would be really difficult out of hours. So really, it's about routine working during the day when you've got the resources around you um, for education, learning, development, picking up on things that might have changed, ensuring that you're safe to practice. Jen, do you want to come in there? Have you got anything to add to that? No, I agree. I agree with you. I think it's during the daytime so that there is a, a level of supervision and somebody that you can ask for advice if you're not sure about something. OK, thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. We've got a uh, question in the chat from uh, from Ian. Um, how might a hospital get good engagement from senior hospital staff if there are concerns I'd identified in the capacity plan? This appears to be a common question from hospitals. Can you give any examples of how to get good positive engagement? It is. It is something that we see commonly and it's a challenge um, in many, in many hospitals, I think. And that is the importance of your capacity plan and your evidence. Um, so as long as you have evidenced the problems that you're having and you've clearly outlined the risks as far as the MHRA are concerned, and they've talked to many, um, many of us on our inspections about this as a transfusion laboratory manager, you've done what you can. And then you need to you need to escalate that through governance routes or whatever your route is within your hospital to say that there is a problem here. I can um, measure that problem and I can demonstrate it and I can tell you what the impact is um, on patient safety. Jen, have you got anything else you yeah. want to add there? Data, always data, evidence, facts, pick it up in any incident reports if it's related, anything's related to staffing levels or anything to do with the capacity plan, but it's really the hard data that should do it for the senior management that you can back up with evidence and facts. Thank you. And a question from Sue that, that I'm sure a lot of us will, will identify with. Um, a lot of Band 7 staff still work on the bench and participate in out of hours. If we also have recruitment issues, how can we realistically take them off the out of hours rotor? So the, this is, where we were trying to be pragmatic with the standards. So the 2014 version says that they should not work out of hours um, and recognise that in today's world, actually, that's very, very difficult to achieve. So the new standards say they should not be routinely included. That does mean if you've got periods of time where you have vacancies and to provide a safe service, they need to be working out of hours. That gives you some flexibility to do that. But the standards are a set of teeth to raise that problem. And to be able to go to your senior management team using your capacity plan and everything else and say our advanced scientists are working out of hours um, regularly because we don't have enough staff to cover the out of hours period. So really that's like changing the working wording of the standards came from a recognition that there will be times probably in many hospitals where the senior staff are required to work out of hours to cover uh, to provide a safe service um, but that should not be routine and that shouldn't be the normal in your establishment. Brilliant, thank you. Um, a similar question uh, Lin from, from Linda. Uh, and what are your thoughts on newly qualified band five staff lawn working out of hours in transfusion? If you have a good programme of training and competency assessment and you're satisfied that they are safe to work, they've completed your programme of training and competency assessment and they have um, they're able to contact someone who is experienced where it talks about having experienced members of staff available out of hours, then I think that is safe. You, your staff are trained, competent, able to offer a safe service and they've got someone to go to if they are unsure. Um, I think that's common practice now again that um, junior staff are working out of hours, perhaps loan working. But the key thing is that they have gone through that training and competency assessment. And we know that that can take 12, 18 months for someone to come through the to the other side of that and be deemed as competent and safe to work. So they shouldn't be working out of hours alone until you are confident that they are safe to practice and they have completed your local 
program. Jen, have you got anything you want to add to that? I would say exactly the same. Yeah, you should have a set program within your lab. And as long as they've met all the requirements and done all of the competency assessments successfully, then they should be okay to work out of hours. Brilliant, thank you. And a, a, a similar question again, and, and perhaps you, you, you answered part of this, uh, a question from Tim. Uh, the part about BMSEs working alone needing further transfusion qualification has got some of the team there asking if they can't work night shifts as they don't have one. Uh, and so Tim asks, how would we risk assess uh, that many of my staff don't have one from the appendix? Um, is, it, is it having a good and robust competency um, assessment process in place? So again, um, taking the pragmatic approach, there will be lots of reasons why sometimes people may not have a, something from those list of qualifications. So you have got the alternative of mapping their experience or whatever um, your your local policy or local competency um, process against the outcomes of the IBMS, whether it's higher specialist or um, I uh, specialist portfolio, depending on what level these grades of staff are, um, and. I appreciate that seems like quite a, quite a complex task when you first start talking about it. And that's why we've provided you some examples on the website um, where you can look at your the person's practice, their experience, your competency and training programme and what you've covered and map them against those education requirements. Lovely, thank you. Now, besides um, lots of good feedback in the chat and some thank yous, um, I don't think we have any outstanding questions and um, we do have a few minutes if anybody's got any that they want to either uh, put into the chat or raise their hand and ask. Otherwise, um, unless Kerry and Jenny, you have anything more to add, um, we will uh, we'll close today's session. Just to recognise Graham's comment that I haven't updated my slide, that there is an, um, a newer edition of the Good Practice Guide, uh, 2020 edition. OK, um, I think on that note, then um, I'll just say thank you to both Kerry and Jenny for joining us today and for providing uh, a fantastic update on, on the work of um, the UK TLC. Um, some really interesting points to take away. Um, so uh, thank you again for taking the time today to join us. Um, thank you to Sasha, who has been working hard in the background, providing the admin support for today. And thank you to um, around 145, 150 of you who, who joined us uh, this lunchtime uh, to come and listen to this talk and join in the discussion. Um, we meet again uh, next month, as usual, on the last Wednesday, which is the 26th. Uh, that will be between two and three again. Uh, details to be confirmed and shared, so keep an eye out for that. Um, a reminder that as you've already registered, you do not need to register again. You'll, you'll just receive the automatic updates now by email. On that note, we will close today's session. Um, thank you again and see you next month.